recorded in 1923 in America. And um, James Morrison was born, I suppose, we're here to talk mostly about his life in America today. But, uh, <coughs> matter, anyway. but uh, we're, we're here to talk. Oh, I'm too far now. There we go. Yeah, um, James Morrison was born in Jumfin, just outside Riverstone, the 3rd of May, 1893. And his people had been there for over 150 years. And that area was very much like a lot of South Sligo, just an absolute mecca for traditional music. And uh, as Seamus said a few minutes ago, this is a uh, marks a hundred years since he went to America. And uh, it, it really was, he became one of the most prolific recording artists ever in Irish traditional music history, recording from 1921 to 1936. And uh, this was the influence Newton from once his records were made up until today and tonight is a big concert at the Lock Arena which I'm lucky enough to be playing in that every single tune played tonight will be tunes and versions all we got from the playing of James Morrison so, so it's incredible that 100 years on it can still be such a landmark influence and um, so before he went to America it's sort of it, it's nice to understand some of the reasons maybe why he went or why he couldn't stay in Ireland at the time like many people went and um, in late 1912 Morrison was offered a job as a travelling teacher for the Gaelic League of Common with Gaelica, she gladly accepted, and it was at this point that Morrison became heavily involved in the cultural activities of the time. Common with Gaelica were making great strides at that time, trying to reinvigorate things like singing, dancing, music, and of course the Irish language. Uh, Morrison was employed by the Gaelic League, and he was based for the most part around Leitrim, and he lived for several years in Manor Hamilton travelling around to various locations, conducting dancing and language lessons through the medium of Irish. Uh, with the emphasis of the Celtic Revival and by ex extension a substantial branch of the Gaelic League and the regeneration of traditional arts in Ireland, music and dance and education came to be per perceived as a prime source for linking the past with some of the future nationalistic aspirations. And in doing this, music and dance as it was both reflected and defined the notion and polarisation of the revival. Uh, it's very clear that Morrison was ideally placed at, the t at this time to become a new member of the elite teach teaching staff of the Gaelic League, to travel around to various locations teaching through the medium of the language. Morrison was also a member of the North Breffany Coast, the Canter, the, um, the organising, I suppose, a, nearly like a, a county board for, for that whole area. It was going to be one of the people spearheading the revival around that whole area, organising classes, not just ones he was teaching, but for other people as well. While employed as a travelling teacher, Morrison was for the most part based in Manor Hamilton in North County Leitrim. The travelling teacher of dancing and music had once again become a familiar visitor to many areas throughout the, just the late 1800s and into the very early 1900s. There was going to be a lot of travelling dance masters who would have travelled through, throughout areas, going round and round, teaching music, playing music, visiting different houses and staying sometimes a period up to a month and that's I suppose where a lot of people would have learned their music at that time but it had kind of died out at this stage but through the Gaelic League they, they tried to reinvigorate this and Morrison was one of the very first I suppose of his generation to go into that kind of work and um, previous dance masters in the area would have been Morrison's uncle uh, Charlie Dolan from whom Morrison learned most of his dancing as a young boy the type of work that James Morrison was now doing for the Gaelic League was very different to that of which Charlie Dolan would have done. But within the work of the Gaelic League, they brought predominantly rural activities like music and dance to more urban settings. So it's for the most part they were based around towns and villages. And they wouldn't have really been out around the countryside that much as it would have been seen as it was more likely that these would have survived in those areas, I suppose. Um, while based as a travelling teacher with the Gaelic League in Leitrim, James travelled a circle of different schools and halls around the area, instructing up to 200 pupils for the 1912 to 13 term when he was teaching classes in Manor Hampton, Killarney, Kilnasnet, and then Farm, along with several more areas. The teaching of the Irish language and dance was regarded as an extremely important tool within the cultural revival, and Morrison immersed himself fully within us as both a performer a performer and as a highly successful teacher. It was also while based as a travelling teacher that the youth with James Morrison was to make his first documented appearance as a fiddler in a concert that took place in St. Clair's Hall in December 1913. Uh, interestingly enough, Morrison had appeared several places before that in different capacities, but it was the first time he ever appeared as a fiddler. It was an advert for him appearing as a dancer and actually as a comedian at one stage in Ballymose, I think around 19. 
10 or 11. Uh, while based in Manorhampton, James did continue to make many musical trips home to, from Finn, cycling the arduous 18 miles back as often as he could. On these frequent trips home, James often travelled over to Kurt Hover to play with good friends, the well known Gar Gardner family. Of course, um, John Joe Gardner would be regarded as one of the greatest food and fiddle players ever to come from Sligo. His music was definitely just impeccable. Uh, Morrison had, as a travelling teacher with the league, achieved much prominence and recognition that simply would not have been possible if not for the role he took within the culture of revival. When Morrison returned to live in Drumfin in 1914, a time of great uncertainty for many all over the country, but particularly in the west of Ireland. County Sligo and the Irish culture of revival in general was undergoing some major changes, changes that, for better or for worse, were to have a life-changing impact on the direction the life of Morrison was to take. I think propelling his decision to emigrate to the United States of America in November 1915. Shortly before Morrison made the decision to emigrate, he competed once again in the highly prestigious fiddle competition at the Sligo Festival, actually in this very room, and uh, he won that in April 1915. I think it was maybe 10 shillings was the, the prize money, I'm sure it went a long way to pay him his ticket to go to America a couple of months later. And, uh, James Morrison arrived in America and board the St. Louis ship on the 11th of November 1915, arriving at a pivotal time in the development of Irish traditional music there. In 1915, James already had five siblings living in America, for the most part settled in Boston. So when he arrived initially, he did take up lodgings with his sister Margaret in the Peabody area of Boston. His first job was in a shoe factory, but he soon moved on to a less monotonous job in the well-known Essex Hotel as an elevator operator. James's brothers Tom and John were already well settled in Boston, playing in their own band, and the flute player Tom had even begun teaching a dancing class as well. In 1918, James Morrison was relocated to New York, where he joined his wife to be Theresa Flynn, who came from Notre Dame, actually the next townland to Curl Harbor, just outside Valley Moose, whom he had met on one of his frequent trips to the home of the Gardner family. James initially took lodgings with the, the famous piper Michael Carney in Brooklyn. Brooklyn had a very large Irish community at this time, as had many areas of New York, and Irish music was frequent, frequent occurrence there, and some of the greatest sessions ever in New York took place, took place actually in Michael Carney's basement. And James immediately immersed himself fully in the bustling Irish music scene of New York, and a couple of weeks later, in December 1918, he took first place in the very prestigious New York Fesh. It was also around this time, too, that a great breakthrough was made for Irish traditional music in New York, the advent of commercial recording. After initial attempts, attempts in 1899, the first serious attempt at recording Irish music on a commercial scale was made in 1916, when James Wheeler and Eddie Herbert, a banjo and accordion girl from Mayo, recorded for the well-known Columbia record label. This was brought about by actually a Nitra woman, a woman called Ellen O'Byrne DeWitt, who was the owner of the famous a born to wait music store there. And uh, Ellen was trying to persuade Columbia for allowing her to make records, but they didn't want it because they wasn't sure if there would be enough of a market to sell them. So I think what they done in the end, she said that she'd buy the first 500 copies herself for her own music store. And if they sold, would they make more records? But they sold out in Fortnite. So uh, that was the real birth of Irish tradition of music recording. In 1921, James Morrison cut his very first commercial record for the New Republic record label recording the Provincial Hornpipes and uh, Provincial Hornpipe actually, you might just listen to a short clip of that recorded in 1921. Thank you. 
Crossing went on to record prolifically then in New York, recording in excess of 1978, or 90, sorry, 78 records, propelling him and the Sligo style of music onto the main stage, as did his contemporary and childhood friend, Michael Coleman, who came from just up the road in Gladden. But it was an, Morrison also played and recorded extensively as part of various ensembles, including the James Morrison Orchestra and the Instrumental Quartet and the Wandering Minstrels. That's an early Morrison um, ensemble. There was no name on those, an advertisement for the Aaron's Isle Ballroom in um, the Irish Advocate newspaper in 1924. It was very, very early, an early Morrison ensemble. We don't actually know any of the other musicians, unfortunately. But, um, it, it, uh, it appeared several times, but the captain never changed. It was always for the air inside ballroom, so it could have been just a resident band there or something. I don't know. Uh, he did record extensively as part of various ensembles, not this particular one, but across various different ones. But it was undoubtedly through his many duet recordings that we truly see Morrison as a highly versatile and accomplished fifth pair of balls. Morrison recorded extensively in duets with many of the top musicians of the 19th. 20s in New York, including Piper's Mighty Carnival, with whom he had lived with for a, a time 11 years earlier in Brooklyn, and with Tom Ennis. Uh, and he actually recorded extensively with the two of them. Mighty Carnival, probably more prolifically, but he came from, from John McCreena, I think it's called, near Irish Town in County Mayo. And uh, he was undoubtedly one of the most accomplished pipers and musicians of his generation in New York and Ireland. And um, as was this was Morrison's other piper and duet partner, Tom Ennis. Tom Ennis also came from Mayo, actually. It's just incredible, incredible music. And um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I don't have any tracks of um, Morrison and Carney with me. I have tracks at home, but the quality wouldn't really it wouldn't be sufficient to play it out loud. I think through speakers. But we might listen to a short clip of um, Tom Morrison and James Morrison playing a lovely. Here we are, a lovely band that's called the Humorous Band. Again, just such lovely music. Was that, I think there was an awful lot of piping to be heard in Morrison's music himself. He had learned an awful lot of music from a man called Johnny Gorman, Jack the Piper, who would have travelled the circuit throughout North Connacht teaching and playing extensively. He was a great piper. He came from Derry Lahan, down near Paddock Dream, on the Mayo or Stalin border. And uh, he would have stayed around from Finn for sometimes three or four weeks at a time in a house called Mulligan's. It wouldn't have been too far away from Morrison's over in Lacka. And uh, Morrison would have learned an awful lot of music from him. And I actually found an article that said that um, he was a fiddler as well, Johnny Gorman. So I'm sure he had a major, major influence on Morrison. And he did actually on Michael Coleman as well. Um, Morrison also recorded extensively with a great, great melodic player who came from Mayo, a guy called uh, PJ Condon. He recorded two magnificent tracks. With, Gordon Minot, with the Golden Minotan Maestro in 1929, arguably the finest box fiddle you had ever recorded. It certainly was the earliest, I think. Conan was an incredible musician given the limitations of the instrument. He came from Midtown in Golden, he created to America in the early 1900s as well. But he only died in 1969, but he had Alzheimer's for the last good few years of his life, so people didn't get, to, didn't get there earlier enough to interview him, but he was an incredible, incredible musician. And uh, I was lucky enough a few years ago to work on a project to re-release 
all the recordings of PJ Conan on the old time records of the day, and it's well worth getting. A guy called um, Jerry Clark was at and Greg Piper, Emmett Gill, and another recording for Adam Morris, who overall they um, were the, supposed to be the spearheaded it over 10 years ago, which came to fruition I think in 2000. And, 13 and maybe 2012, but it's incredible as well. We're picking up because it's, it's um, very similar to the great work Harry Bradshaw done and Michael Coleman. It's a great book as well. As well. It's, it's well worth getting. But um, we just we had this a short a short clip of uh, Coleman. Now comes with Morrison playing with um, PJ Cannon. It's, it's probably the finest, finest box fit you to ever record. It's a lovely reel called The Tap, recorded in 1929.
out of Morrison's music career, um, or his recorded music career. So, can I take a look at some of the things Morrison did while he was in the Netherlands? While he was in America from 1915 as well, and this was um, that last track in 1928, and uh, he sort of he recorded up until 1936, but after that he took a big break from it. I suppose a lot of the music had changed a great deal in America at that time. But we'll take a, a look at that in a minute. Um, around this time, also around 1928, 1930, Morrison had begun working in a music shop on 120th Street called the Morningside Music Shop. Uh, and one, one story is about there's a famous fiddle player from Johnny Gall called Harry Gillespie. And uh, when he went to America first, I think, I won't even say the year now, so I'm not sure, but I think it might have been the late 20s, maybe everything, but I, I just can't be sure. And uh, he was walking down 120th Street, went into a music shop, and started trying fiddles out. And the man came down to him and asked what he was looking for, a fiddle and everything. I took it up for him and started playing. And Gillespie was just blown away, he couldn't get over the music this man was putting out. But it turned out it was James Morrison after. He was told uh, several years later that he just couldn't get over the music. Um, in the mid-1920s, Morrison also began to teach music extensively in New York. And one of his very first pupils was a man who had recently arrived in America called Paddy Killorn. I thought I'd clip from there, wasn't that clippy of him. Uh, Paddy Killorn came from emigration outside Ballymote and arrived in America in the spring of 1925. Actually, initially he took up lodgings with Morrison and his family in their home in Columbus Avenue. Oh, I had one from here, in Columbus Avenue. And uh, he lived with them for several years. And uh, they actually played together for a while around New York as a professional figure to us. And uh, in several bands, but it appeared they have a difference of opinion sometime around 1929 and 1930. And they rarely came into contact after, which is one of the great pities that they had to team up for the time. But um, Cologne would have almost cited um, Morrison as, as a major, major influence on his music. And actually, a lot of Cologne's later music, especially clips he would have recorded, Towards the end of his life, in the 1950s, in the 1950s and later, would have. Um, <coughs> there we go. That's it. Yeah, in, in the 1950s, would have had a strong Morrison flair. Lauren also recorded extensively in the 20s and 30s, but his music really went back to the more, I suppose, his roots and that Morrison school of music in, in his later, later life. Uh, there's no doubt that New York of the early 1920s wasn't a magnificent place to be. The opportunities for Irish traditional musicians in New York were simply mind-boggling in comparison to the musician, to the life of a musician in Ireland. There was an insatiable demand for musicians of a high quality across the social scene in New York. Bars, clubs, restaurants and ballrooms all required music in abundance. Some of the biggest ballrooms in New York at the time were the Yorkville Casino, the Riverside Plaza Hotel, Aaron's Island Music Hall, the Celtic Hall, Aaron's Island Ballroom, this Columbus Avenue where Morrison would have lived, which is a modern photo that was taken a couple of years ago. But uh, this is a, a little clipping that came from uh, James Morrison, it's an ad from playing in the Aaron's Island Ballroom. And uh, there was another one of those halls that was beautiful and cool with every comfort included. Uh, these were the, the Irish Act of the newspapers at the time was actually being right, but it, it was totally, you know, it was, it was all, all Irish. New York had an incredible Irish music scene. There was a famous fiddler, Andy McGann, who would have came slightly after this, but he, uh, he was saying one time he didn't know there was any other people in New York until he was nine or ten, because everyone he met was Irish. It was pushed over all Irish at that time. Right, and there's an awful dodgy lead here. Of Bear with it as we can. Uh, the crowds in ha halls such as these were immense, and musicians sometimes played to crowds of up to 4,000 people a night. But dances of such a massive scale, ongoing almost every night of the week, orchestras and other musical ensembles were in high demand. Morrison played with several musical ensembles throughout his career, including the James Morrison Orchestra, the Inish Fale Orchestra, Edward Meehan's Rosalind Orchestra, the Aaron's Isle Orchestra, and the James Morrison Instrumental Quartet, with whom he recorded. In, for that his last recordings were made along with the Cortez in April 1936. He moved from a solo musician to the more commercially focused and marketable ensemble, then to two of the, most com the more commercially focused and marketable ensemble playing is one of the most interesting transitions that Irish, Irish traditional music made during this period. The inevitable change from the pure drop Irish music scene is to say to a much more commercially focused and driven musical scene can clearly be seen in the band names of the area. This is something that is probably more apparent than in any other when we look at the career of Morrison's
pupil and old friend Paddy Killorn, who played with up to seven different, different ensembles in New York, from the Pride of Erin Orchestra to, in the 1950s, Killorn's Irish American Serenaders. This is something that can also be viewed from the tunes they record. It's amazing that simple things like the names of tunes and records can give such an insight into the sociological and commercial scene of New York and the Irish in New York, and more importantly, what was making money at that time. Because these people were, they were solely reliant on things like dance halls. The Irish music scene was very much a commercial scene at the time. There wasn't that much session playing or even solo playing at this time. You had to be with a band, and they used to call them jobs. Couldn't say they were going to play, they said they were going on a job. And um, but Morrison, by all accounts, was acutely aware, aware of what he needed to do to survive in the ever increasing commercial music scene of New York, and he did very, very successfully. In 1929, the utterly devastating financial crash happened in America, sparking off many years of Great Depression. This had a devastating effect on all walks of life in America, not least on that, on the up to that point booming Irish traditional music scene. The crash put a sudden end to many a man's professional recording career, as the many record labels in operation in New York and other cities cut their output of Irish recordings to almost zero. Morrison was fortunate enough that he was one of the very few musicians of, that, of, the, of the Irish tradition to continue to record, albeit on a much, much less frequent basis throughout the Depression years. He recorded in 1929, 1931, but where he would have been doing maybe 15, 20 records a year in 1928, it was cut down to maybe four, four a year in 1930, 31, that, that kind of thing. And interestingly, as we touched briefly, as we touched on briefly a few minutes ago, Morrison's music, well, certainly his recorded music, changed greatly during this period too, and without a doubt, in a bit to stay afloat during this time of great financial uncertainty. Morrison had strayed away, however briefly, from recording things like Reels and Jigs to recording much more commercially marketable, marketable music like waltzes, quick steps, songs, etc., etc. This certainly had a much broader appeal to the general Irish populace at this time than, I suppose, the more authentic Reels and Jigs that were around at that time. Rather like today, I suppose, too. Um, Harry Bradshaw quotes one well-known musician of the era saying, of the, of the era saying, Reeves and James don't pay the rent, and they really didn't. You had to do what you could to survive. Um, Harry Bradshaw, too, notes correctly that the tunes recorded by James Morrison throughout his highly successful recording career gave us a clear insight into it, the sheer versatility of the musician and into the wide repertoire, repertoire of tunes and tune types he had with the real, for the most part, predominant during this musical era, as it still is today, Morrison recorded many different types of tunes, not commonly played into tradition. And I suppose they would much more now, but at the time, definitely, definitely not. And things like barren dances, polkas, airs, waltzes, scottishes, set dances, and even several military two-steps. Many of the tunes recorded do appear to have come from several well-known music collections that were in existence at the time, such as the collections of Francis O'Neill, uh, Francis O'Neill was a, a cork man who went to live in America in the 19... Um, he went very early, maybe in the late 1800s, and he put out several, several different books, and the most famous of course is the Dance Music of Ireland, it's still in circulation today. And uh, musicians of the era and, and since would have gotten an unbelievable amount of tunes and tune versions from that. He recorded most of the tune versions at, time, at that time, for the most part, in Chicago, but the music and the... Um, Boots themselves have become just, just world famous at this stage. Uh, the, the, Jesse Smith was saying that he was called the Dance Music Department of the Bible at this stage. It's just the go to thing for musicians. Um, and Morrison would have got several tunes in that, but in particular from the Ryan Mammoth collection of traditional Irish music. Um, Morrison was very unusual in that sense, in that sense, as a traditional Irish music then, especially, was almost entirely an oral tradition where tunes were passed on from person to person, area to area, and as such the regional styles and setting of tunes were much more prevalent. Morrison was one of the very few traditional musicians of the era to have the ability to read and write music, and to actually use music publications to find tunes, many of which he later returned to record, including the well-known reel The Blackberry Blossom, which was the last tune he ever recorded in April 1936. Which, and actually I found the version is strikingly similar to the version in Ryan's Mammoth Collection. Um, by the early 1930s, James Morrison was truly at the height of his musical career. He was busy recording for various musical companies in New York, most notably with the Columbia Company, who were probably the biggest recorders of Irish traditional music of that era. 
and it was also with Columbia that Michael Coleman made many of the recordings. Around this time also, James Morrison owned and ran his own dance hall in New York called the Celtic Hall. And that's an advert for the Celtic Hall in 1935, I think. The Celtic Hall was at 438 West 150, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, the Celtic Hall had previously been called the Roscommon Ballroom and was now one of the most successful of its time, attracting some of the biggest names in the North to play there. The people like John McKenna, Michael Coleman, Ladder Barn, and Peter J. Conn and the Melodic Pair we heard earlier would have played there very, very regular, as did the well known um, musical duo of the Flanagan Brothers. And we can add here. That was for a, a, a testimonial that was held for Peter Conn in 1936. The Kennedy Hall is one of the very finest in New York, owned and managed by James Morrison, the famous, the famed Irish radio on the recording in Sligo by Ailes. And uh, he was very, very well known. And this seemed to run for several, several years, but it sort of disappeared around the early 1940s. And uh, I don't know why he probably just um, concentrated more on his teaching career or something. Well, uh, the Kennedy Hall. The Kelly Hall appears to have run quite successfully for a number of years under Morrison's management and was, for the most part, by all accounts, a highly successful venture. While this period of Morrison's life was indeed highly successful, his personal life is not without its own troubles. Uh, since their marriage in April 1918, Theresa and James had five children. They had been suffering some marital problems and separated briefly in 1930 when James moved in with his old friend and former student, a very famous figure called John McGrath who came from Rossport in County Mayo. James and Theresa did reunite briefly again and another child, Sheila, was born, but shortly after the couple decided to split permanently. James then moved out of the family home, living primarily in the area around 96th Street and continued to play extensively. And it was at this point that James Morrison's highly successful teaching career took off in earnest and he was teaching massive volumes of students from all over New York. In the early 1940s, Morrison was teaching in excess of 200 pupils. Veronica McNamara was one of the very last surviving pupils, and she was actually here just before the flat last year. I came up to meet her and had, had a tune with her. And uh, she, she had great, great, great stories about him teaching. And one interesting thing she did notice was that Morrison rarely, rarely ever thought with the fiddle. He used to play it whatever he wanted them to learn on the fiddle, and then he'd take up the banjo so that he'd be able to hear whatever mistakes they were making. It was a, a very interesting thing to do at the time. And uh, that's a picture of uh, Morrison with several of his pupils in 1945. Veronica is, is uh, just back there in the corner, just beside him. And uh, he was teaching up to 200 pupils at this point, which was an incredible, incredible volume, right up until he died in 1947. He actually taught many different instruments during his frequent lessons, including fiddle, flute, banjo, and melodion. He actually wrote a tutor for the Melodian, published in 1931, called The Measles Simplified Method, How to Play the Globe Accordion Irish Style, arranged by James C. Morrison. And uh, the preface is very, very interesting. It, uh, he was such a well-read man, and uh, if you had to be at that point to put a tutor like that together for an instrument that he... I don't know how proficient he would have been, honest, but it certainly wasn't his first instrument, but it's actually incredibly interesting to go through it today as, as an accordion player. So some of the things he wrote down in us are just, they're just bang on the mark. He was such an incredible, incredible musician. But um, it, it's, it's well worth taking a read of that day. In the first line, music washes away from the soul, the dust of everyday life. But uh, the bit I like particularly is just down at the bottom. When you have learned the tunes by this method, then we both have a work well done. If you should fail, then I have failed with you. It was such an incredible, powerful thing to write at the time. He was really ahead of his time in that regard, I think. He was just an incredible, incredible, incredible man in every way. Um, James made his final and that's actually um, the melodion that Morrison used when um, he wrote it. That, that was uh, held for years by another pupil of his that I'm sure some of you might have heard about that called Joe Cunningham, who just died in three or four years ago. He was an absolute gentleman. And Joe had it for years and years. And we had it restored um, several years ago and uh, by Charlie Harris, great accordion there in uh, Galway, and it's actually there's a great concert now tonight. And um, James briefly mentioned it earlier with the Nottingham Arena celebrating James Morrison's musical life. And if you come to that, you'll be able to hear the motion. It's down there doing sound check without me in the minutes. But um, it, it's, it's well worth listening to. The sound is just incredible. James made his final commercial recordings in April 1936. 
and spent the rest of his life solely as a music teacher. He had at this point teamed up with a curry dancing master called James McKenna, teaching extensively all over New York, and in a very short time the two became the two most successful teachers of the Irish tradition in New York. Aside from occasional public appearances as a solo musician or with a band, Morrison gradually became more and more reclusive until he withdrew almost entirely from public performances in the 1940s, concentrating for the most part just on teaching. Outside of his musical career, Morrison was by all accounts an absolute genius. <coughs> he was clearly a highly intelligent and well-read man and was always interested in challenging himself mentally by taking various state examinations simply just to challenge himself. Uh, it's flat out again, but there's nothing really more to show anyway. There's not a lot more to it anyway. Um, he took various state examinations simply just to challenge himself. And, uh, you know, uh, in particular, they say he had a liking for maths, and his success in these examinations was supposedly very, very high, and he was offered various jobs as a result, but he never took them up on it as he far preferred to concentrate on his professional, his professional career entirely on music. In fact, his success in these examinations was so high and so well known throughout the musical, I suppose, um, family in New York, that on a fairly regular basis, many people planning to sit similar exams came to him for extra tuition. Morrison had, since his time as a dancing master in Sligo, became widely known as the Professor, a title which he lived up to for the rest of his life. And in the late 1980s or the early 1990, there was a fantastic um, compilation put out by Harry Bradshaw. Harry Bradshaw was a man from Dublin who's done incredible, incredible research into many of the mus musicians of that era, and particularly into Michael Coleman and James Morrison, and he put out a great um, compilation. I think it was about 1989 or 1990, 40 Morrison tracks and a little book test, but unfortunately it was only ever released on cassette. I think there's a fantastic project waiting to be done there to re-release more Morrison stuff with a, a lot of updated research that's been done since. Um, James Morrison was found in a collapsed state in his apartment and was brought to the Knickerbrocker Hospital in the Bronx where he died on the 11th of November 1947, 33 years to the day since he first arrived in New York. Like many musicians of the era in New York and elsewhere, Morrison became a heavy drinker and this undoubtedly contributed heavily to his sudden and untimely death. His outstanding musical legacy and recordings surely have not been forgotten and will continue to inspire and mesmerize for many, many years to come. The French philosopher Paul Ricoeur once wrote, to be forgotten is to die twice, and I think we can all be safe in the knowledge that Morrison won't be, won't be forgotten. And just before we finish up, we might listen to it. It's actually my favorite track Morrison ever recorded. A fantastic end. Um, just tune recorded in the mid 1920s. It's, it's probably one of his lesser known tracks, but it's definitely my favourite. The tune was also recorded by Michael Coleman. Michael Coleman recorded as the Curry Man's Daughter, and Morrison recorded as the Fisherman's Mitch. And it's just incredible. And thanks everybody for coming in. I hope you enjoyed it and got a little bit more knowledge about Morrison. We we'll, we'll let Morrison finish off with a lovely, lovely read. <laughs> Thank you. 